What's up, Vanguardians? Welcome back to the Vanguard live stream. Zach and I have an awesome show for you guys today. Sorry we were a bit late grabbing some coffee uh, in tatters as always, completely frazzled. But here we are, ready to go, ready to talk some shit. How's it going, Zach? Yeah, man, we've been rocking and rolling today. Already did an awesome interview that you guys are going to get to check out a little bit later today. So stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, I got coffee in hand, ready to go. We got we got a power stream today. We're going live on YouTube, and immediately after this, we're going to be live on Colin. So you guys are going to get all of your Vanguard cravings filled. We took a little bit of a siesta, as Gavin called it earlier this week. So uh, you know, we're catching up and we're going hard in the paint today to kind of catch up on everything uh, before the week's out. Yeah, we've also both been super busy consuming that new Kendrick album. Loving that. Uh, might even do a whole call-in episode about the album next week, probably sometime. So again, make sure to sub to us on call-in, guys. Make sure to follow us over there on call-in. It's a great time. We really love connecting with our viewers and talking to you guys. So anyway, uh, super excited for today's show. As I mentioned, got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about, some juicy drama, some Twitter beef, and also just some regular news. Excited to talk about this Rand Paul story. Um, but yeah, as always, you guys know, we like to start the show with a big shout out to the Patreon community. Um, so thanks everyone that's supporting the show on Patreon. You guys can hit up the link in the description. It's always going to be found in the description of all of our content on YouTube. Great way to support the show if you enjoy the content we create. Um, we really do appreciate it. We wouldn't be able to do the show without you guys. So a uh, huge shout out. Thanks so much. And again, if you would like a name of your own on the shout out screen, uh, then hit up that link in the description. Find out about the perks we offer and support Lefty Independent Media. But yeah, thanks so much, everyone that's tuned in already. Hopefully some more people trickle in here in the next couple of minutes. Looks like we already got a super sticker. Thanks so much, Abiding, for the 99 cents. Really appreciate that, man. Um, but yeah, what's on your mind, Zach? Well, man, that depends. A lot's on our mind. Uh, do you want to start with the drama? Do you want to start with the news? Should we give people a little taste of it and and break it all up? Uh, it's up to you, man. We can dive right in with the jank meltdown uh, a la Joe Rogan if we want to just give the people what they want, or we can uh, sit and make people wait for it. I do want to talk about this Rand Paul story first. So let's get into that before we get into the big explosive Twitter war between TYT, Jimmy Dore, Jank Uger. Uh, I mean, Glenn Greenwald jumping in there. A lot of, lot of crazy stuff going on on Twitter the last few days. The discourse has heated up. Um, but yeah, I do want to talk about this Rand Paul story real quick. Uh, huge shout out also to Charles. Thank you for the five bucks. Charles, you guys are geolocated in the center of the USA, and I think it helps your objectivity. You don't have any New York or LA cultural bias. Keep it up. Thanks so much, Charles, not only for the donation, but for the kind words. Glad you're enjoying the show. And yeah, Zach and I are as Midwestern as it gets and proud of it. Yeah, man, uh, you'd think that, you know, we're a little mean on our show, but in real life, we're real friendly Midwesterners. Um, and and I, I honestly, I do think the fact that, you know, we've grown up as leftists in a environment where that is not the default uh, and where the cultural, uh, you know, norm is definitely a little removed from Gavin and I's politics, uh, as I guess you could say the entire United States is, but specifically, uh, you know, Kansas, Red middle america politics specifically the bush era and obama era having a really big impact on me and gavin before when we were young so yeah i think it keeps us uh, objective like you know i still love and care about my family that makes me want to pull out my hair because they're fucking terrible ass opinions you know and i think having that balance is, is something that's beneficial for our show yeah absolutely 100 percent. And, and yeah that's a good point zach you know a lot of people watch our show and they they find out that we have this show and they see how intense we get and aggressive we are sometimes on air um but in real life you know, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about political disagreements, regardless of how far removed they are from my own personal ideology and, and beliefs. You know, I, I actually really enjoy having conversations with people across the ideological spectrum about politics and just whatever. Um, so, yeah, I think that definitely is the case. And thank you also, by the way, for the 1999 um, ZDRA89. Really appreciate that donation. Have you guys heard of billionaire Larry Silverstein and how he updated the insurance policy on the World Trade Center to cover terrorism just months before 9-11. You guys are doing a great work. Well, thanks so much for the super chat. And I do remember hearing something about this, something super shady like that, some billionaire like making a huge, you know, investment, uh, essentially, or uh, I guess in this case, an update to the insurance policy. I've also heard about something involving an investment, uh, someone that got rich, you know, millions of dollars overnight thanks to 9-11. So yeah, there's definitely some sketchy stuff going on there. 
Yeah, man. You know, um, one of the thrills of my life was talking about 9-11, you know, conspiracy theories with the, the governor, Jesse Ventura. Uh, and I would happily ask him about this the next time we get to chat. So I'm going to feather this away uh, specifically for you, Zedra89, because uh, I'm actually not super familiar with this, but I love going down this rabbit hole. So I'm a little surprised uh, and I will definitely be doing some research on Larry Silverstein. Do you know wh where Larry Silverstein made all of his money? I guess I could fucking Google it and find out. But anyway, thanks so much for the $20 donation and we really appreciate it yeah thank you so much zedra really really appreciate that donation but yeah let's get into the news uh again before we get into this pretty explosive uh <clears throat> twitter drama excuse me um let's talk a little bit about rand paul let me pull up this story uh this is pretty crazy because we were just talking actually about this 40 billion dollar bipartisan effort to swiftly pass Ukraine aid, as CNN headline says. Again, this is mostly weapons. It's what they call lethal aid. Uh, so again, most of this money is not actually going to Ukrainian people in the in the form of food or supplies or anything like that. No, it's it's mostly going right into the pockets of the defense contractors. Yeah, it's not going to the Ukrainians at all. Yeah, exactly. It's going to defense contractors. It's going to the CIA. And it was passed with the support of the squad and obviously every single other Democrat. Uh, the only dissenting votes were actually from the Republicans, I think 57 votes against it. Um, but in the Senate, it looks like it's come up against some uh, intervention from Rand Paul. Uh, what was your thoughts on this, Zach? Well, this is like a weird time, right? Because there's two things where we have to give Rand Paul a pat on the back when we talk about him for just this week. And like I said, Rand Paul is not a man that typically has what I would consider politics that 100% align with mine, though I will say to give him credit out of any Republican in the Senate, I think he's the most consistent on standing true on his own two feet uh, for what he actually believes in or for his values. Um, you know, and or his donors values, right, depending on how cynical you are. But he the man stands on his fucking ground. You know, he's happy to work, uh, you know, to sponsor a bill in the Senate that maybe Ro Khanna has sponsored in the House, uh, um, you know, get, you know, to quash the U.S. selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Of course, Ro Khanna changed his tune as soon as there was a Democrat in the White House. And we've seen, uh, you know what, fair and square, Ro Khanna, or um, excuse me, um, Oh, Rand Paul has not changed his tune, right? Despite the fact that, uh, you know, now, it, it, that, you know, when Trump was in office, he was opposed to this. When Biden was in office, he's opposed to this. Uh, you know, he's not playing for teams. And I was just really bummed to find that Bernie Sanders wasn't also willing to jump in the cage and say, I'm also going to put my foot down, too, because I don't like it uh, as a leftist, right? As somebody who has mammoth disagreements with some of Rand Paul's other policies, though him and I find ourselves in lockstep here uh, for the most part. Uh, you know, I don't want the right to be able to claim this anti-war positioning, right? Uh, I think that this is something that the left has to articulate that we are also, uh, you know, always going to uh, firmly oppose, you know, basically lining the coffers of these ex uh, military contractors, these weapons manufacturers, etc., and that we're going to be on the side of de-escalation, that we're going to be on the side of diplomacy, of, you know, uh, governance. And, you know, as Gavin made the point on our call in the other day, obviously, because Gavin and I uh, oppose escalation of the tensions and war in Ukraine, you know, we, people, uh, you know, will say, oh, you're so callous, like you don't care about the people of Ukraine. Oh, if this was your country, you would be singing a different tune. It's like Gavin and I would have no problem if they were sending hot meals and, you know, blankets and formula or well, formulas and shorties were like, but um, you know what I mean? All kinds of these things, human aid elements, right? Just like uh, I want the United States to provide those things for our people. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have a problem with us spending some of our massive GDP as the richest country in the world, uh, you know, uh, providing aid to other countries that need it. Of course I wouldn't. I'm, I'm a socialist. I yeah, believe like, in like we were talking about on the call in, for example, when there's a hurricane in Haiti, you know, we give them millions and millions of dollars of aid. Uh, this is pretty normal. And I'm not opposed to that. You know, if there's a humanitarian crisis going on in another country, I'm okay with helping out. I'm just not okay with funneling $40 billion of taxpayer money right into the coffers of the defense contractors who are just enriching themselves uh, based off of the suffering going on in Ukraine. Yeah, 100 percent. And so I guess my big takeaway from this is like, one, you have to give credit to Rand Paul because he is consistent, right? I think he is probably the only Republican that is so consistent on, uh, you know, his anti-war positioning, his non-interventionist positioning. Uh, so I think it must be said that a lot of the other people who are making these cases are often frauds. But I, I think you could consistently rely on somebody like Rand Paul to oppose uh, in escalating, uh, you know, with another nuclear armed power through a proxy war in Ukraine. Um, and it bums me out that we don't get to see 
Bernie Sanders up here talking about how ridiculous this is, how ludicrous this is. I mean, Barbara Lee voted to send $40 billion in lethal aid to Ukraine. Like, what is happening, right? Like, our fighters are are dissipating, it seems like. And and it's, you know, you have to point out, like, who is actually fighting this? And it's like, well, in this instance, it's literally only Rand Paul, who's a scumbag that didn't want to take care of 9-11 first responders. Um, but in this instance, he's making the right call, and we're going to have to fucking... Uh, you know, swallow our pride and choke on the rind and tell you about another time that uh, uh, he uh, that just this past week that was also based. But yeah, what was your reaction to this guy? Yeah, pull up that video, by the way, of him going off on the uh, disinformation board, because that's a that's an interesting video I want to play too, Zach. Um, but yeah, th this is really interesting. Again, Rand Paul is someone who, when it comes to economics, for example, couldn't be further from where I am. Uh, as you just referenced, Zach, he was, I think, the sole vote in the Senate that prevented 9-11 first responders from getting government health care. Uh, I mean, how how horrible, how cruel can you be, right? Like, what a horrible thing to do. Um, so, you know, when it comes to that side of things, economic, social safety net could not be farther from the man. However, when it comes to foreign policy, there actually is a real alliance here. And this isn't the first time that we've seen something like this. In fact, not even a year ago, Rand Paul and Bernie Sanders were working together together to block arms sales in Saudi Arabia. Uh, again, he was reaching across the aisle working with independent Senator Bernie Sanders to block an arms sale to Saudi Arabia. So uh, again, this isn't the first time Rand Paul has actually taken a principled stand here. But as you reference, Zach, what's so disappointing is that this time he's doing it alone. He's not doing it with the help of Senator Sanders. And that's just what I really find tragic. I think a lot of other people feel that, too. The fact that Bernie is not stepping up and taking the courageous, and obviously correct stance um, in this instance and allowing the right wing to capitalize on it. Here's some tweets I found just, you know, doing a base search for Rand Paul. Um, this this user says Bernie Sanders did not block the 40 billion bill for Ukraine, but Rand Paul did let that sink in. Uh, so, again, pretty crazy. Um, here's another tweet from Patricia, Patricia Dowling, who says if Bernie Sanders was half the man I used to think he was, he would be standing shoulder to shoulder with Rand Paul. And it's interesting because, you know, Bernie is so much more in line with my politics when it comes to economics, when it comes to having a robust social safety net. It's almost like I want Bernie on economics and Rand Paul on foreign policy, because for the most part, Rand Paul does seem to be pretty on point. I'm sure he has some positions I you know, wildly disagree with, but uh, this is the kind of shit that I want candidates, that I want politicians to be doing. You know, Bernie should be using his ability to block legislation in the Senate in instances like this. Um, so again, it is mind blowing that it, it fell on Rand Paul instead of Sanders. Yeah, and uh, uh, let's play. I got this uh, clip pulled up uh, right here. Gavin, do you want to show another example? When you, this could uh, this This is exactly what I would want Bernie Sanders to be doing. Uh, or, or if you did you have another tweet you wanted to go for the okay yeah if you just pull up this uh video really quickly i just want to show everybody uh another example uh they pulled it on breaking points the other day uh let's let's just watch this really quickly and then i want to talk about it for a second because again it's so embarrassing that it's only Rand paul that is making this case because then it's going to be so much easier for the political establishment to just be like look it's just this wackadoodle Rand paul the son of ron paul that other wackadoodle that we smeared and and yeah sometimes Rand paul is wackadoodle but on this instance he's correct and that's why i don't uh, that, that's why i'm bummed that there isn't you know somebody like bernie sanders or or just literally anybody at all that is you know standing side by side and being like yes you are doing the right thing uh but let's watch this because it's honestly like i never thought i would say this but it's pretty basic do we have policies? Do we have guardrails? Do we have yeah, standards? But here's the problem. Ensure, we can't even I mean, agree. We can't even agree what disinformation is. This is you well, can't even agree that it was disinformation, that the Russians fed information to the Steele dossier. If you can't agree to that, how are we ever going to come to an agreement on what is disinformation so you can police it on social media? Legally, I think you've got no idea yeah. what disinformation is, and I don't think the government's capable of it. Do you know who the greatest propagator of disinformation in the history of the world is? The U.S. government. Are you familiar with McNamara, the Pentagon Papers? Are you familiar with George W. Bush and the weapons of mass destruction? Are you familiar with Iran-Contra? I mean, think of all the debates and disputes we've had over the last 50 years in our country. We work them out by debating them. We don't work them out by the government being the arbiter. I don't want guardrails. I want you to have nothing to do with speech. You think we can't determine you know, speech by traffickers is disinformation. You think the American people are so stupid they need you to tell them what the truth is? You can't even admit what the truth is with the Steele dossier. I don't trust government to figure out what the truth is. 
So just wanted to play that really quickly uh, for a couple of things. Something that they go on to point out on breaking points, and I want to reiterate, is the fact that the other thing you have to pat Rand Paul on the back for in this uh, instance is the fact that every single example he gave of government disinformation came from his own party. And that shows a little bit of spine that we don't see from the Democrats very often. I wish Bernie Sanders was there by his side to say, hey, look at all the disinformation that's come from everybody, right? Like, let's talk. Let's go back to Jimmy Carter. Let's talk about Bill Clinton, right? Let's talk about all of this shit let's talk about barack obama right and, and, and really complete that circle that way nobody watching this nobody watching this can deny uh both of the major parties complicity uh in the failure of of ever trying to you know control the regulate information right uh you know the so-called ministry of truth as it's been dubbed by so many people online and i think correctly right because it uh, it, it evokes the the kind of fear uh, that we should all be feeling and the, um it, you know so I, I just thought you know one we need to have more leftists that are out here speaking out like this because that message that Rand Paul just made that resonates so hard with the American people and somebody made a comment earlier about how Gavin and I are in Middle America so we can speak to that Middle Americans feel so much more similarly to Rand Paul uh, than any like than any of the messaging about how oh well we should take these people like no. People, it remind like people feel exactly like Rand Paul does on this instance so much. And if we give this issue away to the right, it is going to be an enormous weapon for them because they're actually going to be correct for once. And that is something that the left, like the left, can't even hit, get over their hurdles when they're just a uniform propaganda machine. If they actually are wielding something that is correct, uh, that is a firm value that is so so ingrained and. In, massive um, uh, basically every american uh it feels like a ma massive majority of americans i should say right because uh, obviously there are people that are pushing back against free speech but they're not pushing back against their own free speech just yours right uh and so that's the other big giveaway um so if we let the right wing dominate this discussion if we let them take this as their cardinal issue uh the left is going to fuck themselves for another two decades and then we're all going to die from climate change so this is uh, important shit to talk about in my opinion Oh, it a hundred percent is. And you're absolutely right that, you know, people feel exactly like he does, at least as far as this censorship issue goes, this is actually something that people have serious opinions about. And he's speaking to that. Uh, so again, like you said, Zach, it'd be great if the left would follow suit and, you know, hear from some of these people, whether it's Bernie Sanders or um, Ilhan Omar, like, why are you not speaking out about this fundamental right of free speech? Why are you not talking about this more in face of the Biden administration installing what is, yeah, uh, literally basically a ministry of truth. So, you know, Again, a lot of stuff I disagree with on Rand Paul, and I think that if he was a serious libertarian, then he would be speaking out a lot harder against what uh, the GOP is doing as far as abortion rights right now. You know, it's like, you know, we could use some of this fire when it came to taking down your own party and their uh, very anti-freedom approach to reproductive rights and to women's health care. Um, so waiting for you there, Rand. Obviously, like I said, there's 101 issues where I vehemently disagree with the guy, uh, but we give credit where it's due here. And, and again, if Bernie Sanders had been making that speech on the Senate floor, uh, then we would have been here going, woohoo, this is the best thing ever. Um, so when someone else does it that we happen to disagree with on a number of other issues, going to give credit where it's due, guys. It's uh, it's called honesty. So um, yeah, we're not Rand Paul simps, but he happens to be 100% correct on this issue. And again, it's weird to see um, someone on the right wing sounding more like a leftist than the supposed you know left wing politicians are. Yeah, I mean, 100%. And uh, again, uh, though we can't give the same, you know, I get like um, long term fixture. Like, what is that called? Like a uh, conviction point to somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's that exact same headache that I'm having, too, when she's out here being like, why are we sending 40 billion dollars in aid to uh, lethal aid, by the way, I'm talking about weapons, m money that's just essentially going to disappear into the hands of Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and show up in the form of bombs and, and mass destruction devices, right? And we're not talking, they call it lethal aid to make it sound way nicer than what's actually going to arrive there, right? Uh, and, and, and obviously, you guys know that if you listen to our podcast, but uh, having to listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene explain that to people uh, and also make the case that we need to be reinvesting in our own country domestically, something that obviously she doesn't give a shit about. What is the major thing that Donald Trump accomplished what he gave major tax cuts to the rich, right? Uh, I guess you could say that he also gave people $600 checks a week during the pandemic, which is, you know, more than Joe Biden gave. Uh, well, that was unemployment. Yeah. $600 unemployment checks are more than you get now, that's all I'm saying. 
Um, but anyway, so it wasn't like he was out here being like a, a stalwart fucking man for the people, right? He gave tax cuts to the rich and, uh, you know, did a bunch of idiotic shit and never, never accomplished any of the like pro pop, you know, the, all the pro populist things like his uh, new trade deal was a disaster uh, for the American working class, etc. The list goes on and on and on. Right. So it's not like Marjorie Taylor Greene is this like principled figure out here, but she is delivering the right message, a correct message to people. And that uh, I don't know. I disappeared for some reason and now I'm small. Uh, um, Gavin couldn't take all the energy coming out of my microphone. No, uh, uh, um, but you know what I'm saying though is that uh, she she's going to be a broken clock. That's right, twice a day. But it gives so much more oxygen to the conservative movement when they can actually say things that are true. Uh, again, when they've done so well with just patent lies for so long. You know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And to be honest, uh, again, I would never vote for Rand Paul. Uh, but seeing this kind of fire come from Rand Paul does make me wonder why he's not more—he's not talked about more in the 2024 conversation. It seems like everyone on the right wing loves Ron DeSantis, but uh, in my opinion, Rand Paul is a much more compelling voice. You know, he's a lot. He's willing to take these tough calls. He's not as embroiled in the culture war. Again, I disagree with Rand Paul and way too much to ever vote for him. Um, but you know, if I was on the GOP side, if I was on the right wing, um, then this is the guy I would want. Not fucking mealy mouthed, obvious, phony Ron DeSantis. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because it, it, we talked about this. What was it earlier this morning? Um, you know, he did run for president in 2016, and he was really forgettable, man. Like at least to me, I, I, I he, I mean, with, with the entire clown car spectacle, right? Of like Chris Christie, Ben Carson, Donald Trump, uh, Ted Cruz. Uh, you know, all of these guys like, uh, I mean, God, what was her face? Uh, the woman with the uh, abortion uh, videos, Carly Fiorina. Like there were so many people to keep your eyes on uh, during that election cycle that it was like, oh, God, you know, maybe he just kind of got edged out to the side. He couldn't make a name for himself. So, you know, uh, this new Rand Paul that we're seeing is much more uh, eye catching. It's much more, um, you know politically savvy i think uh than what we saw in 2016 so yeah just from a straight up analysis perspective i don't know if he would be able to take down trump just because trump has like 25 percent of the republican party and with a crowded primary that just means he's gonna win um right even though he's less popular for sure for sure he's less popular than he was in 2016 by a lot but you know, while he may have had like half the Republican Party in 2016, like he will have 25 to 33 percent, especially if he gets back on Twitter. Uh, a lot of people think that doesn't matter. I do. Uh, I think that I think that he'll get you know back in the media and people will start talking about what Trump tweeted about because the media is desperate to start covering Trump again because it's been so hard for them to and it's such a boon for their uh, you know viewership. So all those kinds of things playing together. I don't I don't know if he would win in 2024, but he would definitely provide an interesting counterbalance to the conversation uh, and and it would be interesting to cover it and and you know time will tell. Yeah, I don't know if he would win either. I, I doubt he would, but I'm just surprised there's not more of a movement on the conservative side to get him to run because you're right. He was totally mealy mouth, totally forgettable in the 2016 primary. Um, but in the last year or two, we've seen a lot of fire coming from Rand Paul. Remember those uh, takedowns of Fauci that he did? Got a lot of views on that. Again, I don't always agree with the guy, but there's no denying that he's a compelling communicator. Um, and he is seemingly more in touch with uh, some of the more like populist instincts when it comes to anti-interventionism and when it comes to uh, not flushing down the toilet, our tax money on war and defense contractor handouts. So, you know, again, uh, when it comes to economics, he's he's very far removed from where I am. And and to be honest, you know, a big part of the reason why he is delaying the approval of this is because he's a deficit hawk. Um, so, you know, while we have to give him credit for uh, not flushing our tax dollars away in this instance, part of it is because he's a principled deficit hawk and he's not going to approve any uh, $40 billion package regardless of what it goes for. So, you know, he would also block a $40 billion package if it was, you know, to to institute Medicare for all, universal health care. Let's not get it twisted, guy, guys. Uh, this guy is a deficit hawk. And, and if, again, this bill was to help the American people, uh, he also wouldn't be voting for it. He would also be blocking it. So, you know, I this don't guy's not give giving you stimulus check. Right, exactly. He's not out here clamoring to give the people more stimulus checks or anything. He's a deficit hawk through and through. He's a uh, libertarian when it comes to economics. Um, uh, he just happens to, you know, it just happens to align in favor of the correct position here. And again, we're going to give credit where it's due. And I thought this was a really interesting story. Again, I'm, it would be great if someone like Bernie Sanders joined him in this cause, but I kind of doubt it. Um, you know, 
we'll see what happens. But anyway, we did get a couple super chats real quick to address before we move on to this. Uh, TYT versus Jimmy Dore, Glenn Greenwald, Twitter war. Uh, super excited to break that down. But again, got to get through a couple super chats real quick. Thank you so much, Step Cat, for the five bucks. Watch two sex of or two seconds of Jinx rant over it over the TYT hysteronic uh, delivery style. It's a sore head and tired. Well, we're about to get into that step cat. So uh, just stay tuned. Yeah, you get to see even more histrionic personality disorder coming from Jank Huger. Exactly. Thanks so much for the five bucks though. Really appreciate that. Thank you also, Andrew, for the $5 and one cent. Really appreciate that, man. Never thought Rand Paul would save us and the progressives wouldn't say what you want about Paul's motives. It still shows me labels are meaningless. Um, yeah, I mean, agreed. I, I never thought he would be the one to do this either. Although I do think in a sense, like I said, he's adhering to his libertarian deficit hawk principles. So in that in that case, uh, the label would apply. You know, he is living up to his libertarian deficit hawk values. So in, in that sense, the label is correct. Yep, 100 percent. I think that yeah, I think that it's just, a you know, um, two different ways of getting to an end point. Right. Like your our rationale is completely different, uh, but we arrive at the same point. So I think that his label as a libertarian, he's actually just right now earning that title a lot more than he would be, uh, you know, as Gavin mentioned during the like row debate now, like, you know, obviously now he's, you know, not throwing his libertarian weight all behind like, oh, I'm hands off everything. But if he was, I th and, you know, we've had debates with like real hardcore libertarians and, you know, just friendly discussions too. I say debate and people think we fucking hate each other. No, I just, you know, massively disagree with a guy like Spike Cohen, uh, who we've had on our show multiple times to debate, uh, you know, his politics, which sometimes I think are bastard crazy. But, you know, he is like... 100% a libertarian so he you know supports abolishing the police like he you know thinks a woman's right to you know choose what happens to her is 100% up to her and not the government all those kinds of things so uh, I would agree with Gavin that you know the libertarian uh, ethos or whatever even though I don't agree with it would kind of umbrella you know oppose war yeah oppose war and just uh, the deficit hawk element of it too yeah. hand in hand um, so thank you so much Andrew really appreciate that and thank you, Jaswar, for the two bucks. Javelin, javelins used in Ukraine near 200,000 each. That's truly, truly crazy to think about. Thanks for the two bucks. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for the $2.17. Time to start a fight. Team Johnny or Team Amber. Uh, stay tuned, Andrew, because we're actually going to be talking about this on our call-in episode today. As Zach mentioned, right after our live stream today, we're going to be continuing the show on call-in. Uh, where we have uh, uh, an episode coming up where we're going to go down or we're going to uh, break down this situation, talk about the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial and hear from you guys. So really excited to get into that. Uh, and you're not going to want to miss it. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun thing because Gavin and I, 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 at our core, consider ourselves media critics. So it'll be fun to talk about it from a media perspective and why the media loves a, a celebrity trial so much uh, and you know why the audience does too. Absolutely. Um, I think we got one more step cat weighing in on the question just asked team victim in this case, Johnny, as I said, we're going to be breaking that down more. So stay tuned uh, for our show on call in after the live stream. Um, thank you also, Eddie, for the 999. I was just having an argument on the Vanguard discord about freedom of speech and censorship with someone. People really think red scare tactics should be used to combat fascism and white supremacy. Uh, that's interesting. I'll have to check out that discourse going down on our uh, discord. Make sure to hit up that patron link if you want access to the Discord server. So I'm glad to see that people are having some conversations. Uh, again, not sure the specifics of this argument, but as you guys know, I'm I'm basically a free speech absolutist. Yeah, look, I mean, I, do I think that there's that it's wrong to say certain things? Absolutely. You know, do I like I you know I'm not gonna say that it's right to say everything that you can say, right? But I don't believe in censorship, no. And so I would kind of come down on that same side of the argument. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for the nine ninety nine, though, Eddie. Really, really appreciate that donation. And again, if you guys want access to the Discord, hit up that Patreon link. It's in the description. Good way to support the show. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for the Super Chats, guys. Going to move on now, um, but keep them coming. We'll respond to everything. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Are you ready, Zach? Are you typing away over there, writing an essay? Well, yeah, in that case, we can move on to the Twitter drama. The beef of the day. It's what's for dinner. I guess it's lunchtime, but beef is what's for lunch, guys. Uh, stay healthy. Anyway, let's get into... A big boy red meat murder. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, Jink Uger found himself trending on Twitter yesterday after Glenn Greenwald 
singled out this clip, shared it to his audience, and mocked Jenk in the process. Let's take a listen here. Um, this is some good old culture war for you guys. By the way, if you're the trans person or several people that slept with Joe Rogan, can you let us know? Because it's obvious that it's personal for him. Okay, Joe, you slept with a, a, a person like that. There's nothing wrong with it. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it, Joe. It's super obvious that you're super into trans people. And you're taking it out, your hatred of yourself on them, and you're making their life dangerous. By the way, if you're the trans person. So yeah, there's the clip. I guess this is from a recent TYT episode or live stream uh, where they're talking about Joe Rogan's um, talking points about the trans community. And you know, this isn't this is an interesting issue. I, I want to be you know clear. I, I don't think that it inherently makes you transphobic to have some of the conversations that Joe Rogan has on his show about trans people. Like for example, uh, I, I don't think it automatically makes you a transphobe to say uh, or acknowledge or just talk about the fact that um, if you've gone through puberty as a male, um, then that might give you somewhat of an advantage over um, people that were biologically born as females and didn't experience puberty as a man. Um, as far as sports go, you know, it's not really an issue that I'm deeply invested in, to be honest, which isn't why we talk about it much. Um, but again, I don't think it makes you transphobic to talk about that because I, I do think there's like some legitimate uh, room to question. I don't know what the solution to that issue is. You know, I don't I don't really know what the exact solution is. And I think it, it gets into hormones and, you know, varying levels of uh, people's testosterone and all, and all that kind of like very complex scientific physical realm athletic realm i'm not a part of that if you guys can't tell I, I clearly don't do much uh sports or athleticism in general um so again i don't think it makes joe rogan transphobic to have those conversations or to talk about those things to kind of question the uh prevailing logic in that sense from at least the um liberal media for example um but i guess what i do find uh to be a little bit more suspicious i guess about joe rogan and this is what jank is getting at in this in this clip where let's be honest he is mostly being humorous i think uh what he's getting at is that joe rogan goes back to that a lot <laughs> like if you tune into a joe rogan episode just with some random person there's like at least a 50 percent chance that at some point in that episode uh they're gonna go back to that topic they're gonna go back to that well and, and joe's gonna give his speech about uh how crazy it is that you know, trans people can participate in the sport, uh, the gender they align with. And it, they always go down that rabbit hole. And I get it because Joe Rogan is involved in MMA. He's a he's a meathead, as he says, you know, he's into sports. Um, but but I do think it's fair to point out that, like, it, sometimes it borders on the obsessive. Like, he really talks about it a lot. He talks about it all the goddamn time and trans issues in general, which again, it's his right to do. He should never be censored. And I think that people, again, that say it's hate speech, I think that goes a little bit over the top sometimes. I think, you know, everyone should calm down and stop with the pearl clutching and actually just engage in an honest discussion about this. Because again, a lot of these issues are nuanced and a lot of them do deserve a discourse. Um, but that being said, I do have to be honest. I thought the joke from Jenk was kind of funny because again, Joe Rogan does obsessively talk about these issues to the point that like, even I've made some jokes about like, all right, bro, it's okay. You can, you can come out of the closet. You can just admit that you want to be a woman, like, you know, kind of jokingly, but I, I think that's kind of what Jake's doing. Right. Yeah, I think so. I think, look, it, it, because of who Jake is and because of how desperately he's been trying to like get Joe Rogan's attention and start beef with him. I think this comes off as really desperate and not like, like this comes off as like the kind of person that like stands up for the trans community or any kind of marginalized community in like the most cringy kind of way uh where it's clearly all about getting like clicks and points from this very specific subsect of the internet that already hates joe rogan uh and already like you know like like he's just he's he's preaching to the choir right now like he is in his own lane and he's talking to his own tyt base and you know he's firing them up with some content that he thinks that they would be interested in let's just be real this is not some like deeply like oh I feel a need to stand up for the trans community and be their firm ally. Like I want to set that for a, that set that aside for a second because I think it's so tr so transparently easy to see through what Jenk is doing. Uh, you know, it's not like there's a 
a, a cadre of you know trans voices that are doing on the ground journalism that are making their appearances on tyt like he's not interested in doing anything substantively uh you know to boost trans voices or do any of the kind of things that you know somebody who is deeply invested in this cause enough to make a fucking you know call out video to the world's biggest podcaster that you've met and you know done been on their show personally and uh, has actively chosen to ignore you because of how your cringy behavior for so long like i don't know so all of that just seems kind of shallow and and when i watched this i was just like oh my god this is jank uger being jank uger um but I do think that it's worth pointing out uh, separately, and and to what degree this impacts Joe Rogan, uh, you know, I you know who's to say, right? I guess we could have like you know uh, our own debate about it, but we'll never know, right? But I do think the real phenomenon that's being broached here uh, is one that is worth discussing, right? And again, to the degree that this applies to Joe Rogan, who knows? But I think that what Jenk is getting at uh, through all of his clumsiness and all of his fucking annoyance uh, is actually a real thing, right? Which is uh, a, a lot of men right uh, a lot of men just fundamentally do not believe that trans women are women they just do not believe that trans women are women right so as more and more trans women you know are out and comfortable and confident enough to live their regular lives and straight heteronormative men uh see them and uh, are attracted to them, right? Because they're women, right? Oh, I saw Laverne Cox in a bikini and I, my dick got hard, right? Like, oh no, does that mean I'm, a, I'm gay now? Like, I hate myself now. Like, no, you saw a woman and you fucking got attracted, right? Like, to her, like, that's what happened. But uh, for so many men, there's like this deep internalized rage that happens because they don't understand why that's happening. Their masculinity is so fragile. Their ego is so fragile. Um, and, you know, that can em emerge in, you know, violence against trans women because they hate themselves for finding them attractive and they want to punish this person instead of themselves. There's no real evidence to show that Joe Rogan is doing that in his day-to-day -day life. So it's a little incendiary to be like, call me if you're the trans person that's been hooking up with Joe Rogan. Like one, as if that person is not entitled to any kind of privacy, as if they're, as, as if trans women uh, who are having a relationship are just downright fucking, in, in, you know, demanded to come out and ru ruin their their whole fucking life could you imagine what it would be like to be the trans woman that's been secretly hooking up with joe rogan and then get that exposed like jank has no concern for this woman or the complexities of whatever relationship he supposes is happening at all he just wants to you know make a point for himself so all these kinds of things i think show the hot shallowness of uh, what jank is actually doing but i did want to point out uh, there actually is some reality to the point that he is doing a disservice by making it as kind of uh you know uh in the way that he does. I think he's doing a disservice to a serious point that could be a real thoughtful discussion. And if he gave a shit about it, he would have had a trans activist on his show, uh, talked about the vi rising violence against trans women, talk about how that originates, talks about their experiences. But instead, he wants to put out a cry to Joe Rogan in the goddamn desperate hopes that this man uh, responds to him to revitalize his fledgling fucking show that doesn't get 1% of Joe Rogan's engagement. You know what I mean? It's sad. And, and that's what I kind of take issue with. Like, don't use the fucking trans community as a weapon to try and, like, stir up fucking uh, controversy for your show. They're dealing with enough already. And I don't even like to be, like, a pearl clutching, like, you know, uh, whatever kind of a... Like, I guess you can say whatever you want on your show. But to me, it just reveals the insincerity of the fact that you're not actually at all invested in, you know, the trans individuals and the, the trans experience and, you know, having sure that they have a, you know, safe, just, uh, you know, existence. Uh, no, uh, you're worried about getting points from your audience and you think this is a, a good way to do it. And that's just gross. Yeah, I do agree that, you know, Jenks relentless pursuit of a, a beef with Joe Rogan is downright pathetic. He really will go to any and all links to, to try to make that happen. Um, so yeah, th this definitely fits in with that trend a hundred percent. Um, but you know, Jank responded to this. So I want to show his response to Glenn Greenwald and others that were sharing around this clip. Um, let me try to find that real quickly. Yeah, he says right here, uh, right wingers like Glenn Greenwald spreading clips like this. Of course, leave out the context. Joe Rogan said today that he doesn't think there's anything wrong with using the word groomer about your political opponents. He then accused LGBTQ community of being groomers in general um so i actually found this clip we can listen to it uh this is the clip that jake's referencing and we can discuss how legitimate what jake said was uh, i haven't actually seen this clip myself yet so i'm interested to see what i think uh let's take a listen 
how do you feel about education? I think it's critical. It's very important. Yeah. How do you feel about indoctrination by people that are educators? I don't like that at all. There's just two diff very different things. Right. And if you want to tell me that they're the same thing, I say, fuck you. Right. Because they're not. Because there's a lot of fucking crazy people that wind up being teachers. Someone said to me that, um, or read this, uh, not all, you know, the term groomer, a lot of people don't like that term online. They're very upset. Yeah, yeah. But they're real. Right. There are groomers. You, you don't like it? Do you not like it because you don't want children to be groomed? Or do you not like it because it's a pejorative that's used against the left? Which is, I think, more likely. Yeah. Well, well, it's not just a pejorative that's used against the left. It's a pejorative that's used against the LGBTQ community at large. Not all gay or trans people are on the left. Um, I, I think the problem people have with using that term groomer as as you know readily as the right wing has been lately is that they're using it in reference specifically to gay and trans people, making that explicit link between being gay, being trans, and being a predator. Uh, so that's what people take issue with. And, you know, obviously everyone's against groomers. Um, but the problem is that the right wing has been singling out, again, the LGBT community as the groomers. Most groomers are straight. Most groomers are cis. Uh, most actual sexual predators, especially of children, are cis straight men. They're middle-aged white men typically are the are the most common uh, predators. And yeah, we'll finish this clip out really quick. But then I do want to talk about the framing of this entire issue. Oh, here's what's more important. Not have people groom your fucking kids. That's what's more important than you getting uncomfortable with this word because it's used by people on the right. Like I saw someone as an argument, someone who I think is an intelligent person say that there should be a block against using the word groomer. Unbelievable. No, no, there should be no groomers. How do you? Yeah. So here we go. So uh, to give Joe, you know, point. I, yeah, I don't agree that we should be censoring the word groomer or like banning it or making it banned speech. But the one thing I will point out to everybody uh, who, who wants to honestly uh, 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 analyze that clip we just watched, how steeped in right wing framing it all was. There's not a specific example given any time of. Yeah, you know, Joe, look that shit up. Rogan uh, and wants to pull up an example of where these kids are being groomed, what specifically is being discussed, what specifically is being taught. Right, and he immediately goes to this line where he says, that, oh, of course, we all care about education, uh, but what we don't want is indoctrination and all these freaky people are becoming teachers. And it's like, OK, well, if you say it like that, just me like it, that, that's so obvious that what you're talking about is like you don't want gay and LGBTQ people to teach your children. Right. All these wacky people like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and the lack of specifics, right, kind of opens it up for interpretation, which, again, is like the battleground for uh, right wing framing, because then it breeds plausible deniability. Oh, that was what I meant, but the people who are looking to receive that information and have that be what you said, I mean, that, that's a whole very common phenomenon in media. It's part of media literacy, right? Uh, people in our audience, you know, typically understand that a lot better, but I think it's worth pointing out right there uh, because of uh, the fact that there were no specific examples given. Maybe they go through in that the entire rest of that episode is just example after example of specific things happening. Uh, I can't say for sure I didn't watch that, uh, but the immediate pivoting to these ideas like, oh, our kids are being brainwashed at their schools. Uh, like that sounds like it's going to be a right wing argument that later on gets used for school privatization and vouchers, right? That's that's what that's what alarm bells go off in my brain, right? And also, I would like to point out that for the longest time, the right wing has been, you know, utilizing some, you know, what is real, uh, actual fucked up things that are happening. Uh, but for a long time, they've been talking a lot about pedophiles. They've been talking a lot about groomers. They've been talking a lot about child sex trafficking, right? And I think this is just the natural extension of that and, and where that keeps going. And what that all means, I don't know. Um, you know, I'm not a fucking, I don't have a crystal ball, no pun intended, but, um, you know, I just... I, I just I, I don't know. I think it's very telling how all of the right all of the framing is extremely right wing and there is no counterbalance uh, at all coming from anybody on the show. Yeah, I agree. And again, it's a straw man to say that, oh, like we don't care about groomers. Like, obviously, we care about groomers. No one is pro groomer. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of people on the right wing right now are, again, specifically linking that concept of being a predator, of being a groomer to being gay or trans. Obviously, everyone's against grooming kids. Uh, the problem is, is enforcing the stereotype that gay people or trans people are predators. Uh, that's the problem. Again, most uh, groomers are straight cis men, um, but I think almost like 
what 99.9 percent of people on the left condemn all groomers wherever they may occur whatever part of the sexual spectrum they may fall on so whether you're a gay person a trans person a cis person a straight person whatever I think everyone universally condemns grooming. Uh, the issue is not with the concept of grooming. It's with linking it so specifically and explicitly to the LGBT community uh, because that's an age old, very damaging, very dangerous stereotype. Um, again, which homophobes and transphobes intentionally perpetuate to uh, endanger further the and smear the trans community and the gay community. So I think that's what this is about. Um, again, uh, and also thank you, by the way, for the five bucks virtuoso. I blame Joe Rogan for grooming Brendan Schaub's horrid stand-up comedy and podcasting career. LOL, <laughs> bro. That is that's an that's an antique joke at this point, uh, and I appreciated it, man. That's aged like wine. I I hadn't thought about Brendan Schaub in so fucking long, uh, but it is one hundred percent true that that is that that he was he was the champion Joe Rogan nut rider, and he went from being a talentless heavyweight in the ufc that was never going to have a, a longevity in a career uh into being a massively popular uh podcaster he does that uh show with brian callen and, and then they have replaced him for a while after brian callen was like almost me too and then like my brian callen came back and now he's on showtime interesting guy um it, i yeah man he's dumb as rocks and his commentary is just like it'll be so funny like my favorite thing about uh, Brandon Schaub is he'll be like, yeah, man, I really hate this fucking thing. And Joe Rogan will be like, I like it. And he'll be like, I like it too. It's just like, he doesn't know personality. It's just a hundred percent Joe Rogan nut writing. But anyway, yeah. Thanks for the $5 virtual. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, and yeah, let's move on now to Anna's response. Cause she also got in on this. Let's see what's up. Let me pull up this. Anna Kasparian basically just responding it, or ex regurgitating exactly what jinx said if you or anyone you know is trans and slept with rogan we'd like to know so we can understand why he's so obsessed with the trans community thanks for helping us get the word out glenn appreciate it um we're just asking questions why is the right wing attacking our free speech why are they so censorious this is an outrage um yeah so i don't really think glenn was saying they should be censored i think he was just kind of mocking them um yeah yeah, and also, again, I, just to make this point, right, because I, I am somebody that actually gives a shit about the trans community, like, they're, the, the like, fact that, like, these individuals that are having, like, human emotions and experiences and relate, they're not just p political pawns for your fucking using, right? Like, maybe this person, it, it, like, assuming that they exist, which there is absolutely no evidence for, but let's assume for the sake of this one fringe argument that they do, uh, yeah. Like, let, do you think that they're just that it should be demanded of them that they're going to be your political prop? Like, oh, you shacked up with Joe Rogan and now you're, you know, a public person that, you know, has to come on my show and I get to reveal your identity and a bunch of shit about you? Like, no. How about, like, like one sexual relationships between p adults are private uh for one who fucking cares if joe rogan is out here sleeping with trans women for one uh obviously that would you know, there would spell some hypocrisy there uh if that were the case but i don't know just the framing of all of this where like uh this like you know potential you know unspecified trans woman uh or whatever is is out here like just as a vehicle or a pawn for them to use to like get one up on joe rogan like hello that makes you look like the opposite of an ally and that 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 make that just makes people like feel cringy like like who the fuck are you like you don't actually care about this you're just doing the same thing that the right does but you're just looking for clicks from your team like this is bullshit gavin actually oh that's okay. You're coming back. Uh, almost. Uh, give it like two more seconds. But Gavin's coming back here, guys. He's starting to come into frame. I can see you make faces and stuff. It's just the audio wasn't coming in. Go ahead and try again, maybe. Can the audience hear Gavin? Go ahead and fill out in the chat if they see people. Blah. Yeah, just try coming out and back in. But anyway, I'll keep talking about this until you get back. Because the reality of this is, is that um also somebody says adam d hello from ireland love the show it's fucking crazy to me let me go on a sec uh, on, a, on a side tangent while gavin's gone over here for a second uh for the fact that and say that it absolutely blows my mind that people in ireland or people in scotland or anywhere that's not america uh is uh, actively involved with listening to our show gavin and i try and pretend uh to ourselves you know that we're um 
well informed and i try and read a lot about you know global politics like we were following the filipino election that was happening the other day with uh, bbm and he was just elected and you know all the ferdinand marco's grandson and all that kind of shit but uh to have the uh time or energy or you know desire to listen to two yaps from another country talk about their own very niche po politics like wow what you're a real one adam d i don't know what part of ireland you're from but um thank you so much for calling in yeah, thank you so much, Adam. And also, thank you very much, Andrew, for the 333. Does TYT uh, realize they look stupid doing this? And yeah, that's exactly the page I'm on, Andrew. I have no problem with sticking up for the trans community. Obviously, we do that all the time on our show. We did that today. Um, but why not just actually make your argument instead of like going down this weird kind of creepy rabbit hole of being like, we want to, we want a, a TYT scoop, uh, you know, talk to people that have slept with Joe Rogan. It's like, why don't you just argue on the merits of the discussion? Why don't you just present your side of the case and make an argument? Why are you like getting into this weird call for Joe Rogan's sexual partners to come on your show? Or it just all feels very weird and creepy, like I said. And, and as you said, Zach, just you know, trying to further this beef, not this one-sided beef, because Joe Rogan's really not even reciprocating here, but just always trying to stir up controversy with Joe Rogan uh, and now just getting really personal and, and kind of weird with it, even though, as I said, obviously I think you know Joe Rogan uh you know i probably agree more with jink and anna when it comes to their takes on these issues overall yeah um anyway and i and i i, I do think that jink realizes that he's a clown it's just that because being a cl clown is his only brand at this point so it's like being a clown or being nothing tyt says dumb shit then doubles down very trump yeah 100 percent. i think that is uh i think that's very accurate um and and kind of again how he stays relevant right now absolutely uh and thank you also a cyclone steve if the right went rang uh sorry if the right is racist then the left is groomers um so yeah a lot of people pointed this out it's like well what the right wing is no different in calling everyone groomers it's no different than when the left wing calls all of their opponents racist or bigots and my response to that would be is that i don't support either one of those things i think it's very counterproductive when left wingers just call everyone they disagree with a, a racist or a white supremacist or whatever obviously if you uh, if you're clearly a racist and a white supremacist then you know it is what it is but like when when some people on the left just call everyone that they disagree with a racist yeah I, i'm against that too oh yeah i mean and, and not only is it uh you know counterproductive usually it's just not the case right like it, i mean the the reality is is that you know um, people from all races and all backgrounds have a variety of perspectives on all different things i mean we just had like the view the other day uh saying like oh black republican is a, a oxymoron right and then you have the joe biden you ain't black if you don't vote for me right so yeah of course it's cringy and it's unproductive to uh just label every pr political adversary some sort of slur like i don't know slur is the right word but just kind of some derogatory term right uh some some sort of demeaning term uh to apply to them right because then you're not actually having any kind of discourse or engagement uh on your ideas man um but anyway <laughs> anyway thanks so much for the two bucks thanks also boeing 757 pilot for the five bucks uh thanks zach for being a good person each of these trans folks is a real person and deserves compassionate treatment they aren't pawns uh yeah 100 percent. yeah thanks man really, always appreciate seeing you in the um chat Boeing and uh, I mean yeah look that's the only point that I wanted to make is like uh, it, it's just cringy when people take an individual from any group right whether that's like you know the LGBTQ community or you know any like a person of color or whatever and just you know stick them up and use them as like a fucking battering ram for whatever they want and like oh this is best for that community without any like kind of comprehension or thinking about what actually is going to that person would endure or whatever so anyway that was just a point i was trying to make thanks for the contribution Bowen. yeah absolutely thanks so much Boeing for that uh, and obviously you're absolutely correct, which is kind of what annoys me about all these culture war arguments like the one we just uh, broke down. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for the five bucks. Thank you also, Mike H. for the five bucks. Not a TYT fan, but why do people say they simp for Dims while ignoring Glenn Greenwald and Jimmy Dore simping for Republicans? TYT criticizes Dims way more than they uh, criticize Republicans. Uh, well, we, we call it out. Uh, regardless, you know, when someone like Jimmy Dore is out here simping for Ron DeSantis or when Glenn Greenwald's out here, you know, simping for the libs of TikTok or whatever. Yeah, we're, we're honest about our disagreements there as well. And, and we're pretty uh, objective and honest, or at least we try to be um, as far as calling out everyone where we disagree and agreeing where we agree. We're not afraid to give credit where it's due. But in the same vein, we're not afraid to uh, criticize even friends of the show when we disagree with them. So um, that's what I'd say to that. Yeah. And also, look, 
you know, we always talk about the framing of all of these things also, right? Like whenever somebody's giving credit to Marjorie Taylor Greene or giving credit to, you know, Tucker or giving credit to fucking anybody that's, a, you know, maybe it's a corporate Democrat, right? We're like, hey, these people aren't on our team. Here's the role that they're doing. Here is the mechanics that are operating in the background uh, that allow them to come to this conclusion, um, you know, and, and I feel like that's, you know, good information to have, but it's also not necessarily correct to be like, this person is fucking lying, right? Well, it's like, well, maybe they're not lying. Maybe they do support this position, but are they going to be with us uh, across the board on uh, the myriad of issues that I support as a, you know, left socialist in this country? Like, probably not. And that's why we have to distinguish those things uh, in real time. But yeah, look, man, I mean, Democrats do, uh, TYT does criticize Democrats a, a lot more than they criticize Republicans. Maybe it's a 50 50 split. They did go down for a while where they were doing a lot lot of trump content um but you know uh yeah i mean i don't have a mass i mean i have a massive problem with sometimes with tyt but for the most part the regular criticism of democrats and republicans is fairly on point yeah thanks so much mike really appreciate that thank you also ariana for the five bucks aren't right wingers the ones with child brides and purity dances red states have the lowest marriage age requirements you're 100 correct ariana and, and that's why we were pointing out um, how disingenuous and dishonest it is to try to uh, try to uh, paint the left as the groomers and oh it's it's the gay lefties the lgbt leftists they're the groomers and predators um, when meanwhile obviously anyone can be a predator regardless if you're straight or gay but the majority of them happen to be uh, straight cis men and and also the majority of them happen to be on the right wing you know the, the Think about the Catholic Church, for example, something we've talked about a lot, but that's basically the biggest example ever of a mass organization of child grooming and um, sex abuse. So you got to you got to think about that. And, and of course, also, when you're talking about grooming, we're talking about indoctrinating school children. Uh, much more of that goes on in the pro heteronormative direction. Uh, much more often, you're going to find examples of gay kids uh, being bullied by their teachers and uh, being indoctrinated by their teachers and hearing about how wrong it is to be gay and how it's a sin versus the other way around. Uh, very rarely are you going to find a gay or trans teacher indoctrinating straight kids into being gay. Like That's ridiculous. But what there is literally documented evidence and proof of is the opposite, is uh, gay kids that try to come out of the closet and then are you know, abused or bullied or harassed by either their parents or teachers or whoever, you know, figures of authority, especially if you live in a super red area. Yeah, 100 percent. And um, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for the five dollars. Yeah, thanks so much for the five bucks. Thank you also, Andrew, for the 545. All Jimmy and Glenn did was show others what TYT said. Uh, they didn't have any they didn't have to say anything. Just hold up a mirror to TYT and laugh. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's undeniable that a lot of TYT is just super cringy and easy to make fun of. Yeah, that's basically the whole left internet. That's why we have a job here. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about it. Um, and thank you, Mike, for the two bucks. I miss Michael Brooks. Same. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I've read about things that, you know, maybe in hindsight, I disagree with slightly about Michael Brooks, and I'm sure I'll hear about it after I compliment the man. Um, but yeah, I, I loved his show. I thought he was a great unifier. He was also one of the really early guys to get in after the, Trump's election and say, hey, no, we need to reach out to these people. We need to convert them to our ideas. They've been lied to. They have been cheated. They have been seduced by, uh, you know, a fraud. And, and we need to get them on our side so that we can liberate them as we liberate all of all people. Right. And that was a message that I think was really salient in the wake of the 2016 uh, era. It was very anti the social justice warrior, uh, you know, form of politics. Uh, Michael had a great sense of humor and he was willing to kind of like push the boundaries of comedy while still, you know, having what would be described by many in the best way possible as a woke worldview. Right. Uh, you know, he wasn't demeaning anybody with his commentary, but he wasn't walking on eggshells either. He was capable of having a good time um, and still always standing in firm solidarity with the people uh, who needed it. So, yeah, uh, what a treasure and, and what a loss to the left. And, you know, one of the things that I'll probably always regret is the fact that, you know, had we started our show, at, you know, maybe eight months sooner, probably could have chatted with the guy. But, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, and also, I miss back in the day when Glenn Greenwald would come on the Michael Brooks show. Uh, do you remember that, Zach? Oh, yeah. Seems like a long time ago. So and much Brianna Joy Gray would go on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying specifically because we were just talking about Glenn Greenwald. Uh, you know, I do miss some of that unity, some of that solidarity on the left. Seems like everyone is at each other's throats these days, which, uh, to be fair, gives us lots of content to react to. But, you know, it is a little bit sad, too. So I uh, did want to get into a few more responses to this Twitter beef jimmy Dore weighed in as i'm sure none of you are surprised 
he responds to this clip and says, if you are a horse who's had sex with Jake Uger, please contact me. Um, and if you're just seeing that and you're like, what, what the fuck are you talking about, Jimmy? Uh, let me quickly play the clip that he's referencing uh, from TYT probably like a decade ago or so, to be honest. But uh, this still is pretty funny. World, I would legalize. God damn, it's pretty, it's pretty low on the yeah, volume. Audio, yeah, turn up your audio, Hella, if you want to hear this clip. Um, but yeah. World, I would legalize bestiality where you are giving where you are pleasuring the animal you see what i'm saying okay okay why, why now why why did that happen this is the dumbest thing it I'm really saying. is the dumbest thing you said but... no, no, yeah so you know obviously kind of some shock jock bullshit um i don't know how sincere he was being uh but obviously anyone that's committing bestiality is going to say they're pleasuring the animal like uh you know most people that are into fucking horses are going to say oh i'm pleasuring the horse i'm not raping it no one wants to say that um but but yeah that that is the clip in case anyone wasn't aware um that is one of jake's hotter takes yeah he manually masturbates caged animals for artificial insemination <laughs> just obviously the quote from Clips. yeah <laughs> anyway that's fucking insane though yeah it's really yeah. disgusting what does he do <laughs> but yeah that's what jimmy was referencing obviously and that is that is pretty funny obviously um again he says if you're a horse who said sex with jane Huger, please contact <laughs> lol anyway yeah so so definitely some explosive drama some pretty heated shit going on here uh no one is holding back um and of course this comes after jimmy Dore has been going after anna kasparian pretty relentlessly over the past week or two some other stuff that we've covered recently um, but this is a nice cherry on top. But yeah, any, any other thoughts on this one, Zach? Oh, man, look, it's just one of those deals where, like, I'm not going to simp for Joe Rogan, right? Like, I, I do think that he has some problematic views on trans people. But I appreciated what you said at the beginning of this stream, which was the fact that, like, the fact that he has questions and the fact that he's, you know, you know, uh, oh, you know, like, if he was t really in narrowly invested on the, like, professional sports thing and, you know, that was like, but the amount of fucking brain space that this man just fucking devotes to every single right wing talking point about the trans community is where it like it starts to get a little fucking irritating and, you know, just cringy, in my opinion, and very boomery and just not not cool. Uh, but then at the same point, I think that Jank Uger is also just doing this not cool, very kind of cringy very out of touch thing where again he's trying to like weaponize this miscellaneous trans person that he sees as nothing more than a political pawn a political object to utilize as a way of dunking on joe rogan as if they're not a robust individual which kind of just goes back to this whole idea of dehumanizing trans people in the first place oh uh you know what i'm saying so uh don't love that either don't love any of the uh, um you know takes from either of those guys on this one but i think it's just show fair to point out how fucking just the molding of Jank Uger, how desperate he is for Joe Rogan to just have anything to do with him, even negatively. He's like the kid that gets no hugs from his parents, so he has to act out at school because getting in trouble is the only, uh, you know, kind of engagement or attention that they get at home. And you know, that's sad. I don't fucking feel sad for Jank Uger, but that's the best analogy that I could come up with. Yeah, no, that's fair to say. Um, did want to say a shout out to AJF Milan. Thank you so much for the five bucks. I think we Americans, I almost read that as Wes Anderson for some reason. Just, I don't know. Anyway, I think we Americans tend to be raised in a way not to keep in class in mind class struggle like many on the self-aware leftists do shrug. Um, yeah, that, that's definitely very true. I mean, uh, as I said, th there's definitely a, a concerted effort from both parties to muddy the discourse with constant culture war discourse rather than addressing some of these class struggle issues uh that's not to say that they're not worth talking about or engaging with sometimes but yeah it's undeniable that there's a concerted effort again by the republican party and the democrat party to avoid doing anything of substance and to do so by just spamming the airwaves with culture war nonsense and, and these constant you know divisive battles keeping us at each other's throats uh instead of uniting and, and against the the one percent essentially that's a little bit of a reductive way to put it but i, I think it, in the essence there's some truth to that 
Yeah, I mean, look, the United States divides us in every single way possible explicitly except along class lines, right? Like you look at the census, it's your age, it's your gender, it's your um, you know skin color, it's whatever, but it's not how much money do you make, right? It, and uh, that's, ex that's you know explicitly intentional to keep us from thinking about ourselves uh, as a collective along class lines, all right? If I start thinking about everybody that makes money in the 20000 to $50,000 uh, annual ranges, like people within my solidarity, people within my bracket, then oh, we might start to do something constructive together about that, right? Uh, so I do think that, you know, there are multiple examples of, of that. And, you know, while I'm not an, uh, you know, a class reductionist, I do believe in, um, you know, what a lot of people consider to be like culture war issues. I, I think they have a lot of validity, but I also think there's a lot of validity to the fact that we also need to be fighting, uh, you know, on all fronts. And one of those has to be a, a undivided class front. So. Yeah. Well, that gets into a whole nother conversation, which someone is referencing here. Uh, women's rights are now culture war nonsense. I never said that. I don't think abortion counts as a culture war issue. I think that's an issue of bodily autonomy, of basic freedom, reproductive rights, uh, and absolutely a class issue as well, because who does the lack of abortion excess affect the most? The poorest women, the poorest people among us, those that's who's going to be affected the most. Um, so I don't think that's a culture war issue. When I say culture war issues, I'm talking about uh, critical race theory, stuff like that. Yeah. And that's what I was also referring to. And it's like, you know, in an abstract sense, like I do support, you know, critical race theory. I think that America does need to have, uh, you know, you know, a critical under, uh, thinking and uh, how we teach our history and have an honest understanding and reflection of of the you know crimes that were committed. And, and in order to move forward, we have to resolve that. But I think that most of the time uh, it just devolves into like a way of fear mongering about our public school system and the way that we educate our people, which in our citizens, uh, which is. Um, you know, obviously, you know, more of what I would describe as like a culture war nonsense. Like, obviously, I think it's you know, more important than the culture war to actively educate our children in correct American history and, you know, teach them. Right. About but the, the culture war aspect of it is that no one's actually teaching like third graders critical race theory. It's like a sophisticated legal theory that they teach to like literal law students. Um, it, it's a moral panic. It's a culture war, quite literally, to whip up uh, a base of people that don't know any better and convince them that uh, leftists are indoctrinating the school children with all of these radical ideas, when in reality it couldn't be further from the truth. Most of the way that American history is taught in the education system is extremely whitewashed, extremely American, uh, America central as far as the perspective. It doesn't go into the imperialism and crimes we've committed abroad, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a non-issue that's just being whipped up into a moral panic kind of a situation in order to uh, enrage the base. So that's the culture war. Right. And, you know, the only thing that I would add to that is that, you know, I would actually be in like I would be in support of, uh, you know, teaching our, our uh, students, uh, you know, a, a more uh, robust and authentic version of American history. But the fact of the matter is, is that that's not even up for discussion at all. Right. Uh, you know, uh, it is uh, very, very uh, definitively skewed in a pro-American uh uh, reading of, of U.S. history, no matter what state you go to fucking school. And so this uproar and panic, uh, you know, is pretty ridiculous in my view. But, uh, you know. Yeah. And Zach and I aren't that freaking old. You know, we, we were in high school, what, four or five years ago, uh, maybe less than that. I remember the way they taught us about Columbus and they, you know, taught us about all, all that shit. I mean, it's fucked up. We graduated six years ago. That's crazy. Yeah. Any, anyway, I, I specifically maybe the maybe the woke leftists have completely taken over uh, and infiltrated the education system in the last six years. But as far as I remember, there wasn't a bunch of woke critical race theory being taught. In fact, literally quite the fucking opposite. Um, thank you once again, AJF Milan for the five bucks. Culture warring is by design is Sorry, culture warring is by design by the elite. Elites desire the left-right clash and are scared to death of the top-down one. Yeah, like I said, 100% correct. Um, although, again, I just think that uh, like wokeness, culture war is a, a somewhat overused term. And like we just said, you know, abortion, for example, is not one of those issues. That's an actual class struggle as well. Yeah, 100 percent. And just to kind of add on the point that you are making, AJF, um, you know, if you read a lot of scholars, um, you know, who are concerned about writing about like the, you know, black experience and racism in America. You know, one of the things that they will explicitly tell you is like one, um, you know, in order to create a, um, uh, you know, a class divide, you know, they they created the mythology of racism. Right. This happened before America was a country. Right. But in order to, uh, you know, subjugate uh, and, uh, you know, treat individual human beings as property. Right. You invent 
racism and then that justifies this you know poor treatment of individuals and then you internalize that over generations and it's like okay uh now uh post civil war we have had you know hundreds and hundreds of years of you know deeply uh you know internalized you know white supremacist racism in uh, our country and then you say okay well it's all over now because we just had the civil war so everybody's equal uh, but you still have this massive mythology of of racism and so this allows um you know the affluent white southerners to uh draw a line between uh the liberated and freed slaves and the poor sharecropping white uh you know southerners uh, and this is just one example obviously this is not the definitive um you know history but uh it, you know it was to create a line between them so it was like oh because you're white i am more like you and because i'm not black i am less you know like this uh, other person who sh much more similarly shares my material uh, existence and it's much more complicated than that the history of racism in america but one of the fundamental elements of it was to create a divide uh between uh the sharecroppers uh, and the individuals who worked on uh, plantations uh, with the just enslaved population that was, you know, free labor. Uh, and, and obviously that continues uh, in some forms to this day, but it's, uh, you know, anyway, right after the Civil War is where it can most uh, explicitly be seen uh, for an example, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Anyway, thanks so much for the five bucks. Really appreciate that. Um, and the only other story that I wanted to talk about, Zach, unless there was something you wanted to discuss, was this recent Twitter beef between... Uh, Dan Crenshaw or Dan Cringeshaw. Crenshaw. Yeah. So I'm like, who are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. So let's get into this. This is a, a tweet from him talking about our open borders and the fentanyl pouring across it, which is killing Americans in record number. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, he says, they only care what the radical immigration groups think, not you. Um, and then someone replies, Chig Bungus, uh, what a wow. legend. Uh, Chig Bungus weighs in here and says, yeah, you sound off about that stuff, but then you vote yes on a $40 billion package to Ukraine. And by the way, brutally, mercilessly ratioed Dan Crenshaw here, uh, 17K likes to Dan's measly 2.5. So whew, that is brutal shit, guys. That is a ratio to high hell. Anyway, Dan Crenshaw responds says, yeah, because investing in the destruction of our adversary's military without losing a single American troop strikes me as a good idea. You should feel the same. So definitely very triggered in his response to, again, Chig Bungus. Uh, <laughs> uh, before we get into Marjorie's response, Zach, did you have any comment on this one? Well, one, shout out to Chig Bungus for uh, c coming in with the big facts. But uh, yeah, one thing I just wanted to point out to you is if you go back up to the top, this is like, this will reveal you know the Republican fucking framing, right? Uh, we have the exact same border policy that we did under Donald Trump. Here, let me quickly pull this up for everybody to see this because this is breaking news that we wouldn't normally talk about. Uh, but Gavin, if we throw this up really quickly so everybody can see uh, that a federal judge extends order blocking biden administration from rolling back title 42 early ahead of hearing this is the exact same border policy uh that has been implemented uh basically not allowing people to exercise their constitutional right to seek asylum in america uh or be uh, safely held in uh america while their uh you know asylum cases are being heard all this stuff uh devastating uh you know for the individuals that are trying to you know seek asylum in america and this man is trying to pretend that we have an open border and that's what's fucking pouring fentanyl across it killing americans get the fuck out of here uh they only care what the radical immigrant immigration groups think not you so they, they literally have exactly what they want i showed you a fox news fucking article about how it's the exact same immigration policy that we had under donald trump uh so this just shows you that there's absolutely no authenticity in the uh, republican party's positions uh right here uh but yeah let's go ahead and team up for uh, marjorie taylor green that was just the one thing i wanted to add yeah that's that's totally fair totally correct uh but yeah anyway uh so yeah this exchange happened then marjorie taylor green weighed in she says uh so you think we are funding a proxy war with russia you speak as if ukrainian lives should be thrown away as if they have no value just used and thrown away for your proxy war how does that help americans how does any of this help and again you know, much like Rand Paul, couldn't disagree with Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, more on, on so many issues, probably 99% of them. But a broken clock is right twice a day, guys. And, and this happens to be one of those instances. Uh, Comrade Marjorie is 100% correct. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, she probably wouldn't have taken this hard position if uh, it had been Donald Trump that was trying to do this in uh uh, you know, Ukraine and, and, and pick, start a fight with Russia. Right. Um, but that being said, she's hundred percent correct here. And, um, you know, a lot of people 
uh, acts like the United States arming Ukraine is what's best for the Ukrainian people. But uh, reality is that the, a negotiated peace would be what's you know going to end the destruction uh, and, and save lives. Uh, and that's what we should be campaigning for. Um, so, I, again, you know, really uh, uh, out of context, just reading what we've read, really hard to disagree with this at all. Yeah, I mean, she's 100 percent correct. And again, if this was like Ilhan Omar or someone tweeting this, we would be out here saying she's absolutely correct. And thank God someone had the courage to say it. So, again, it brings me no pleasure, it brings me no joy to give Marjorie Taylor Greene, literally an insane person, credit for anything. But got to do what you got to do, man. And, and she is correct here. It is a proxy war. Um, and, and yeah, obviously, Dan Crenshaw doesn't actually care about Ukrainians. This dude is a neocon. This guy is a warmonger. He doesn't give a fuck about human life. Are you kidding me? Uh, so, you know, she's totally right to point out his hypocrisy there. Uh, but this does go on. Dan Crenshaw responds, still going after that slot on Russia today, huh? Uh, just what a what a tired, pathetic, uh, lazy response, literally no different from, you know, back in the days of the Iraq war, when critics of the invasion of Iraq, uh, spoke out and, and were labeled as, um, apologists of Saddam Hussein. Oh, what do you, what do you love dictators? You love authoritarian dictators. Wow. Basically Dan Crenshaw's doing the exact same thing, playing the same card. Oh, you love Putin. You just trying to get a job at RT completely ignoring the substance of the point she's making completely refusing to actually, uh, engage with the, the content of her message again just baselessly asserting her to be a pawn of putin or somehow trying to you know get a job at rt yeah and this is the kind of slimy shit that we see all the time on the left right uh this is just happening between two cringy right-wing politicians right it's like you say something i don't agree with and now you're fucking a sadist or a putin puppet or a fucking whatever you know yep yep same old tired lazy discourse uh but yeah you know, Dan Crenshaw is about as cringe as it gets, uh, and specifically on these issues. You know, at least some of these Republicans like Marjorie Taylor Greene have seemingly somewhat better inst instincts on this foreign policy kind of stuff. But Dan Crenshaw just represents that very old school Bush era neocon. He has no um, ability to kind of, uh, you know, get in sync with the actual people and, and you know, represent the position of anti-interventionism and spending our tax dollars here domestically instead of in these conflicts and proxy wars abroad, uh, which at this point is basically a, a right and left wing consensus. Most people, most working normal people uh, don't want our taxpayer money being flushed away to conflicts and to proxy wars halfway across the world um, in continents that we're not on. Uh, people like Dan to Crenshaw. escalate with nuclear armed power, right? Right. To, you know, expediate all of our demises at the hands of nuclear weapons. So, you know, most people aren't out here waving the flag for war like Dan Crenshaw is, but again, he's too out of touch with the actual people and, and too in touch with his, you know, uh, defense contractor donors to understand that, which is, you know, how you get idiotic brain dead bullshit like this. 100% man and um yeah it's we don't talk about republicans too much on our show because it's just Gavin and I think it's so boring to just go through and say the same shit that we've said every single day since we were like 11 right kind of dunking on republican talking points like we're more interested in getting our own ducks in a row here on the left and so we have our own niche but sometimes we just can't fucking help it we'll see some shit on twitter and we're both like yeah we need to talk about this today and honestly guys um with uh <laughs> With Rand Paul uh, being the only one to buck the $40 billion uh, spending in the Senate with, uh, you know, the entire squad voting for it in the House, with Ro Khanna voting for it in the House, with anybody that could have Barbara Lee voting for it in the House, anybody that you could have said, Jesus, God, you're going to be able to see through this. Nope. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. We had to talk about these fuckers today because they, they were they were the ones that uh, they were the ones that were making the case. And while I doubt some of their motives, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, super, super disappointing. And, and speaking of Barbara Lee, by the way, um, did you see her really disappointing answer on Jim Clyburn and Nancy Pelosi endorsing Henry, Henry Quaylar? Yeah, I did see that clip. Yeah, super, super uh, unfortunate. Anyway, I guess we can end the show for today. Did get a couple more super chats. Thank you so much, Marcus, for the $2. Really appreciate that, man. Um, Thank you so much, Das Post Fleisch, for the 199 Outlaw abortion sounds like big government, 100%. And that's why I was calling out Rand Paul's hypocrisy at the beginning of the live stream after giving him massive credit for blocking the $40 billion um, package to Ukraine. Um, yeah, I made the point that if, you, if you're a real libertarian, bro, uh, you should be chiefly concerned with the state, the big government, taking away a fundamental freedom of women in this country. 
uh, and their reproductive rights. So, yeah, it's totally ridiculous that he's not weighing in on that in a more aggressive way. It would be great to see some of that fire, uh, but on this front as well. Yeah. And, you know, like we said, there are a lot of libertarians that that actually is one of the issues that they're really strong on. So it's a little bit interesting to see uh, Rand Paul not lean into that. Right. As a, as a self-identified libertarian, like, you know, follow uh, Spike Cohen on Twitter and watch him get into some de debates with people about, you know, government overreach of women's reproductive freedom. Like the dude will go fucking nutcase and be like, no, fuck you. I'm not I'm leaving any of that. He doesn't believe in the military. He doesn't believe in, you know, the fucking uh, police at all. Right. Uh, he doesn't believe in national parks for the most part. Right. So it's like, um, you know, that's consistent libertarianism is like, you know, I got into an argument, one guy about like whether or not he thought we should have any regulation over the healthcare industry he says no. So like that is hard core firm across the board libertarianism which is not 100 percent embodied by um you know rand paul and in this instance it would be beneficial to the left if it was absolutely thanks so much dos Bose. thank you also so much tool droid for the 1462 really really appreciate that um crazy when you find yourself agreeing with marjorie taylor green and rand paul and not the squad who all voted to fund this insane war cost um think of what that money could have funded domestically here in america exactly correct and that's the point we were making yesterday and today on the live stream it's like 40 billion dollars is so much money guys. and homelessness so twice it's and 20 billion twice. how much would it cost to completely repair flint's you know lead pipes probably a pittance compared to that package uh yet we can't afford that and haven't for years it's absolutely insane and again you know when zach and i go outside we see people freaking sleeping outside homeless you know how, how can this money be spent when when people are sleeping on the streets here in America? It, it blows my fucking mind uh, and to see our country become look more and more like a developing country, a third world country every year that goes by. Um, it just makes it all the more insane and just all the more obvious too the fact that our government is bought and owned by the donors, by the defense contractors, by all these special interests. Um, they're the ones calling the shots, guys. If we had a government full of people that actually cared about serving the the constituents which they were elected to um then we wouldn't have this but again they're not the ones in control it's the corporations it's the defense contractors uh corporate america um that's that's who's calling the shots yeah, they have a word for that in America and other places as well. It's called oligarchy. Um, but yeah, it's what a fucking day or it was when I, I mean, I, I'm with you too, Druid. Gav, Gavin and I, we had to crush some beers and be like, what the fuck is happening, right? What the fuck is happening? Did we wake up in the twilight zone? I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. I had to take a couple days and just be like, what the fuck is going on? But anyway, thanks so much, Tool Druid. You're a real one. Always great to see you in the chat. And thank you as well, Kimberly Mims. Uh, always great to see you as well. Thank you so much for the 499 donation and super sticker. Yeah, thank you so much, Kimberly Mims, for the 499. Thank you, Mike H. as well. Uh, at what line should abortion be legal, legal or illegal? In my opinion, it should be between a woman and her doctor. That's how I feel about the issue. Um, I'm guessing you're on the same page, Zach. Yeah, man. Look, this uh, this right wing framing that like all women are out here trying to get like a abortion when they're like seven months pregnant, right? And kill a live fetus, and I don't know what the fuck that that would. Do you know what kind of trauma that would inflict on a woman do you, or a person at all, right? Uh, do you know what kind of trauma people who have to make these decisions go through? So, look, at my point, it's none of my fucking business, right? I'm never gonna have a child biologically. It's never gonna fucking happen to me. Uh, so, as far as I, I'm concerned, it's not my place to fucking dictate what the woman does with her own body. Like, I just straight up feel that way. And no, like, what if it's eight months and she fucking kills it, man? Like, you know, what? when is that happening? Show me the data behind how many fucking women are just fucking killing their babies at eight months, right? After they've carried it and gone through all the pain and emotional turmoil and all these fucking things. Like, give me a break, man. Uh, so not that, I, not that you're saying this, Mike H. I'm just saying these are uh, arguments that people make uh, when they try and, you know, bring down the hammer on like, you don't even support late term abortions. It's like, I don't support any fucking government oversight about this. I support medical oversight and making uh, decisions between you and your doctor. Never been to fucking med school. I don't know. Uh, you know, that, that's the reality. I don't give people medical advice on this show. That's been a really consistent theme of ours, and we're going to stick to it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that the you know the doctors know a lot more about that than us or anyone in the in the legislature that's making these examples, which is why it should be between them and their patients, their clinics. Uh, so anyway, that that'll be my answer. Thanks so much for the super chat. Thank you also, Dan, for the twenty bucks. Regardless of their motives, I, I'll support the rhetoric of any representative, Republican, Democrat, Independent, if it helps to prevent radiation burns. Uh, or brings the doomsday clock back a second. 
that's our philosophy too, Dan, which is why we're honest, uh, intellectually consistent and, and give credit where it's due and where we criticize people even on our team when it's due uh, is because, yeah, we're not in this to, you know, support a personality or to play for a team. Um, we're interested in the correct outcomes being reached and the correct policy being implemented. Um, and if we have to ally with some unlikely folks from across the aisle, um, I'd rather do that than not see any progress at all. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, through grated fucking teeth and with a lot of caveats, we come at you and we deliver the truth uh, as we see it. And so, uh, yeah, that's what we try and do. And we really appreciate the support, Dan. I know you're a longtime listener. I recognize seeing you in the chat and we appreciate the $20 donation. Yeah, thank you so much, Dan. Really, really appreciate that generous donation. And, and thanks for the comment as well. Thank you also, Donald, for the 10 bucks. Um, why wasn't abortion codified or something related to it into law a long time ago? Eight years of Clinton and Obama, they could have made it some law for a good long while. But we've been asking that exact question here on the show, Donald, uh, you know, just super frustrating the fact that they have not. But let's be honest, the reason why they haven't is because they want to keep, you know, uh, saying, oh, we well, got to come vote for us. You got to come vote for us. If you want these uh, rights to be codified, well, you got to vote Democrat. We're never actually going to do it, but we're going to keep promising. And if you don't do it, then the Republicans are going to win. So what you're going to do, got to vote for us. Sorry. That's why. Um, but it's super frustrating that they, they use this as a political tool, a point of leverage against their voters rather than actually just, you know, doing what they promised. Yeah, you guys ever go to the, you guys ever, you know, you might not be as trashy as us, but you guys ever go to the dog races or the horse races or whatever, you go see the Greyhound, Greyhound and Dogs race and they held that fucking bone out in front of everybody and the whole time it's just a bone on a stick and it's kept right in front of the dogs and they all chase it around the track. That's what the Democrats have been doing with the fucking row and any other thing that you fucking give a shit about, right? It's the bone while you run around the fucking Greyhound track like a dog. OK, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's the game and you're never going to catch it and they don't give a shit about it, actually. So I like um, how you implied that no. you attend dog races. <laughs> I don't attend dog races, but <laughs> I didn't want it to be. I, 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 do you know? Who's, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> never mind. I was just going to say, I, was, I do know a couple of people who like the dog races, like my grandpa used to like going to like horse races and shit and gambling. It's a very like Kentucky Southern type thing, thing to go. Super Kentucky. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for the super chats, guys. Really appreciate that support and the, the commentary. Love engaging with you all. And if you love engaging with us too, uh, then head on over to Call In. It's available now on I and sorry, Androids and iPhones. It's an app, of course. Call in C A L L I N. Follow the Vanguard. We're about to go live and do the second half of our show over there. Um, and as the name suggests, you guys can literally call in. So if you have a disagreement with us or if you just want to uh, agree with us, talk about whatever, feel free to call in. We're going to be focusing the majority of the episode on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case. Um, something which Zach and I aren't experts in, but we do have some opinions. We want to hear from you guys too. break down this very interesting case, not just the specifics of the case, but also the impact on the media landscape and uh, just the, the nature of a trial like this playing out in public. I think there's a really interesting conversation to be had there. Um, and of course, Zach and I have a lot of nostalgia for a lot of Johnny Depp movies. Obviously, I was a big, you know, Tim Burton kid, loved Edward Scissorhands and stuff like that. So, you know, th there's a lot of stuff to talk about. I'm excited to get into it. Um, so, yeah, yeah, and also just to clarify, guys, I just was using the dog races as an analogy. I googled it. There have been no operating dog racing facilities in Kansas City in over a decade, and I also saw a bunch of. Apparently, it's really fucked up dog racing. I love my dog. I would never fucking do anything that it was is really uh, harmful to up. animals. Yeah, the majority of dogs apparently like die in dog racing, like after the races or something. Yeah, that's super fucked up. What I do know more about is horse racing. I know for, for sure that still goes on, but I don't. I don't attend either of those. I was mostly just trying to insert myself into the analogy I was giving for fucking you know uh entertainment purposes jesus christ but anyway yeah like, zach wow, likes... that joke didn't really happen to you bro you fake immediate <laughs> zach also likes cock fights <laughs> he's out here fucking betting on the cock fight in the west bottoms anyway uh but yeah also thank you ariana for the five bucks no such thing as an unborn child in the womb it's a fetus once it's born it's a child there should be no government in a woman's bodily autonomy i 100 percent agree with that ariana uh 100 agree thank you for spelling that out for us Yep. Uh, thanks so much for the five dollar donation. And yeah, I, I, I generally agree with that. I just I think that so much firmly just I'm in the position where it's like, look, it's not up to me. So I just pass the baton to people who have medical degrees and who have gone to school and understand the whole development of children and how to help uh, individuals who are giving birth and, you know, keeping them uh, safe. And also, you know, the autonomy that comes with the fucking growing in your body. And those both of those things don't apply to me. So I just feel like a little bit of a uh, I don't know, like a, I'm not offensive or I, I feel firmly in my ground that like it's not my place to say. But I also am just like. 
that's about what I have to say is like, I don't have a position. That's yeah. And, and I don't think the government should be doing a lot of regulation when, I mean, it, they should be doing regulation, but when it comes to issues like this, another one would be um, medically assisted suicide. I don't think that the government should have any say in that. If you want to uh, make a decision between yourself and your doctor to end your life because you have a chronic illness, or even if you don't, even if you're just super depressed and want to fucking die, I think you should have that right to do it. I think you should. Um, I think you 100% should have the right to legally medically take your own life. And that's another issue where um, the right wing uh, who pretends to be in favor of small government won't have it. So there you go. Um, but thank you also, AJF Milan, for the five bucks. We must accept that at the national level, our system is more an aristocratic, oligarchic, oligarchic and plutocratic nation. Oh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how long you've been watching the Vanguard. AJF Milan, but that's something that Zach and I have 100% accepted that we absolutely live in an oligarchy or a plutocracy. A corporate plutocracy is, I think, the best descriptor, but you're 100% on point. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, chatting so much today, AJF Milan. Always good to hear from you. Thank you so much for that last $5 contribution. And thanks to everybody that tuned in today. We had a spicy stream today, Gavin. Uh, got a lot of people tuning in uh, today. Good numbers for the Vanguard. Just in good engagement from the chat. I like hearing from everybody. Even if you disagree with us and think our takes are full of shit, I appreciate you guys chatting along, debating each other in the chat. And uh, yeah, always a good discussion. And we're super excited to keep the ball rolling. Get on over to Colin. Colin, tell us what you think. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp case. And, uh, you know, what that all means from like a media analysis perspective why are why is there this consensus that johnny depp has been victimized uh what does it mean is this an attempt to rehabilitate him uh because he's a uh you know high value asset to the media machine and they don't want him to no longer be able to make money for them all these kinds of things and more we'll get into we'll get into why people love courtroom drama so much uh etc uh so it's going to be a great call in everybody uh, hit the subscribe button on YouTube and then go ahead and follow us over to Colin. We'll be live at four. Yeah, that's four central, which is 10 minutes from now. Again, so tune in. You're not going to want to miss this extra special, extra spicy episode where we break down the depth versus heard case. Can't wait to hear your guys' opinions on this one. I know a lot of people have a lot of opinions. So again, really excited for that. And thank you so much, Fiona, for subbing to the Vanguard. Everyone be like Fiona and hit that subscribe button. Do it now. Hit the notification button as well so you don't miss the next live stream. Um, but I suppose, Zach, with all of that said, we can get the hell out of here. Sounds good to me. See you guys in 10.